Hello, my name is Gwen Holdman and I am the director of the Alaska Center for Energy and Power at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. I will be your host for a series of webinars developed in association with the Arctic Remote Energy Networks Academy, which we refer to as ARENA. ARENA is focused on increasing adoption of renewable energy systems across the Arctic. As a whole, the Arctic region is a leader in renewable energy development with more than double the global average in the percentage of power generated from renewable resources. Countries like Iceland and Norway, who source virtually 100% of their energy from heat and power from renewable resources, are leading the way. Everywhere in the Arctic, there's a high degree of innovation like hydropower, geothermal, wind energy, biomass, and solar power. ARENA is about creating opportunities for people to learn from one another and explore practical questions about the design, installation, and management of renewable energy systems to support our communities across the Arctic. It's about creating a professional network to better support community leaders and practitioners and make sure that the systems of the future incorporate all of the knowledge that we have gained as a region through the development of hundreds of projects over many years. During the next few minutes, I would like to provide an introduction to remote energy networks. The word remote often conjures up images of distant, sparsely inhabited environments, and certainly throughout the Arctic, there are many examples of these. However, remoteness for an energy system can also have other meanings. The International Energy Authority suggests viewing remoteness from the perspective of causes and effects. The simplest cause of community remoteness is the lack of connection to a centralized energy infrastructure, such as a national electric grid. This lack of connectedness can be made worse by an inability to access the area by railroads, highways, or cargo ships. It is the isolated nature of the energy systems in these communities that makes them remote. There are many instances of this isolated remoteness across the Arctic. For example, in the Arctic regions of Russia, there are hundreds of communities that fit this description. And in the Canadian High Arctic, none of the 25 communities located in the territory of Nunavut is connected to one another by a common grid. Each is served by its own standalone energy system with all of their electric power and heat coming from imported diesel fuel. Or consider the Faroe Islands. A total of 49,000 people are spread across 18 major islands off the coast of Northern Europe and must rely on locally sourced energy. In fact, Every country in the Arctic has some communities that fall under this definition of remote. Remote can also be used to describe energy systems found in the middle of a populated region. Military installations, university or hospital campuses, and industrial sites frequently generate their own heat or power or have the capability to do so as a contingency in the event of an emergency. Not being connected to a larger energy system introduces challenges that Arctic communities are working to address. Their remote systems tend to be predominantly reliant on imported fossil fuels, which can carry significant economic, social, and environmental costs in their transport, storage, and use. And, as Nome experienced in 2011 when fall storms prevented the last fuel barge of the year from arriving, remote energy networks are susceptible to supply chain interruptions, sometimes with potentially dangerous consequences. As a result, remote energy network communities typically experience high energy costs, and in some cases what has been referred to as energy poverty. High energy costs are generated through a combination of factors. Energy costs in some communities have exceeded one U.S. dollar per kilowatt hour for electricity and 10 U.S. dollars per gallon for heating oil, with the results that residents can face energy bills that are over half of their disposable income. Even where costs are subsidized, the true costs are often extremely high and can fluctuate significantly due to variations in global oil prices. The history of the Arctic people is one of ingenuity and adaptability. Across the Arctic, we've developed expertise that can create remote energy networks here and throughout the world. Navigant Research, an internationally respected firm specializing in the analysis of economic trends, estimates that the global market for isolated energy grids will grow to $20 billion by the year 2020. So this presents an opportunity for business development for our Arctic nations as well. 
These remote energy networks, which range widely in their capacity and details of their actual configuration, are often referred to as microgrids. Whether their requirement for self-sufficient operating capability is due to geographic isolation, size, or the other factors we have considered, they have several functional elements in common. Each generates electric power, and in some cases heat, locally from one or more energy sources, one of which typically is some sort of fossil fuel, diesel fuel being very common. Wherever there are locally available renewable energy resources, these can be harnessed and integrated with these fossil fuel energy systems. They each have energy customers whose needs are served by the system. These include residential, commercial, and community loads that are constantly fluctuating, sometimes very quickly and unpredictably, and have different levels of importance and sensitivity. Each also has a distribution network that connects the energy source or sources with the energy users. Finally, a control system serves as the brain of the whole system and manages all the generation and customer electrical demand. Energy storage can also be a key component for some systems. Let's look at some of the many locations across the Arctic where these hybrid renewable microgrids are being used to serve the needs of their communities. In Alaska, where I make my home, about 70 community energy grids are powered in part by renewable energy, including small hydropower, wind energy, geothermal, biomass, and solar systems. For example, the community of Kotzebue in western Alaska has one of the longest continuously operating systems in the state with commercial scale wind energy since 1997. Kodiak Island, through the integration of their wind and hydropower resources with a small multi-technology energy storage system, has demonstrated it is possible to turn off their diesel generators and operate off renewable resources alone over 99% of the time. Iceland stands as a world leader in geothermal energy development and shares their knowledge globally via the highly respected United Nations University Geothermal Training Program in Reykjavik. Using district heating systems and leveraging hydropower resources, this island nation is nearly 100% powered by renewable energy for both its heat and electrical needs. The Swedish island of Gotland does not rely solely on its high voltage cable connecting it to the mainland for its electricity. Instead, they are supplementing this with high penetration levels of wind energy, getting 38% of the island's electricity from available wind resources, and combining this with other technologies such as biogas, solar photovoltaics, smart metering, and local control devices. In the Faroe Islands, Project Grani is balancing an increasing amount of wind power with pumped water storage, as well as two different sets of variable loads on the island. These include heat pumps for salmon breeding facility and two cold storage facilities for the island's fishing industry. At these facilities, they can adjust the timing and intensity of heating and cooling to match wind power availability, matching the demand with the available supply. The energy needs of the town of Ilulisat in Greenland are being met by a 22 megawatt hydropower plant located underneath Greenland's ice cap at a location about 50 kilometers from the town. The plant's turbines are 200 meters underneath the surface and are connected to a meltwater lake that feeds them through a tunnel blasted into the permafrost. The plant replaces an existing diesel-driven power plant and provides electricity for the town and the local district heating network. In the community of Bechico, the Tlicho Investment Corporation operates the first aboriginally owned biomass district heating system in Canada's Northwest Territory. Their wood pellet boiler and district heating system provide heat to multiple community and commercial buildings. These are just a few of the many examples of remote energy networks being used across the Arctic today. We'll learn more about some of them in other ARENA webinars as we explore the important topics related to the design and operation of hybrid renewable microgrids in the Arctic. As I mentioned at the beginning of the session, you can find additional information including upcoming webinars and the on-site program at the ARENA website. I hope you'll join us in the future.